Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another um, Quarantine with Brenna Free. Um, I, as always, am Tori. Um, we're having a good time this week. Um, I didn't have to grade pretty much anything, so that was always fun for me when I don't have to grade. Um, keeping no, on, keeping on in good old quarantine. Um, I have my Hatsumi Miku shirt on today um, because I love me some Vocaloid. Um, and I've got my cute little Blue Ranger Billy um, Funko guy. Um, he came with a set that Jen got me for my birthday one year. And Blue Ranger is one of my favorites. Um, I love Billy. Um, he's great. <laughs> Um, yeah, I haven't done too, too much this week. Um, just same old, same old. Lots of meetings, lots of Zoom meetings. But without further ado, I'll pass it on over to Brenda. Hi, everyone. This is Brenda. Uh, this week has been he hella busy for me. I've been greeting a lot, and I've been um, meeting with students and doing a lot of um, just things to keep myself busy. So um, I started sewing this week. Um, my sewing machine was um, busted, and so I had to buy a new one um, because uh, I have an industrial one, so I actually need a repairman to come to the house, and because of quarantine, um, that's not possible right now, so I just bought a cheap one, and so I started sewing masks this week, which is great just because initially I was going to get a sewing machine anyway for my cosplay because um, I think it was a few years ago that um, I sewed my own cosplay with the help of my aunt, and so I really wanted to start doing that a lot more. And so I wanted Batwoman, a Batwoman, right? Yes, it was a Batwoman um, cosplay that I, I made myself. It was super cute, everybody, by the way. Thank you. Except the super skirt was a little short, and so I was very self-conscious of that as I was walking. Great. On. Thank you. Thank you. I just tried to like not think about how short the skirt was, but um, thank you. Just great. It was um, Batwoman from DC's Bombshells. Mm -hmm. And when I showed the picture of it, because the next year um, we actually met Marguerite Bennett and I showed her and she like, eyes got white and she like gasped and she was like, you guys look amazing. Because um, uh -huh. Jen was um, Lois Lane um, yeah. from Bombshells. Um, and yeah. she was, was like, you get that compliment from her on a costume that like I, I constructed with my uh -huh. aunt. That was hello. That was very um, high praise for me. And so I just really wanted to do that more often. Um, when I was growing up, I sewed a lot. Um, because both my mom and my aunt were seamstresses um, in the sweatshops downtown. So I really, I took it up because I enjoyed it. But then I just stopped. I didn't, we didn't have a sewing machine anymore because we moved. And so I just didn't pick it up till very recently. And I, I enjoy it. I like putting things together. Like I really like puzzles. Um, I love my Legos. Um, so <laughs> it's just something that I enjoy. So I figure bring my passion and, you know, do some good. <laughs> together my masks right now are not great mostly because I don't have a lot of material so I had to order some and I'm waiting for that but anyway um, my nerd um, object of the week actually deserves a introduction so if you guys can hear that can you guys hear that I can yeah. hear it. It's showing up it's the doctor <laughs> <laughs> I like his 3d glasses they're very cute I like that there was like a drum roll. <laughs> yeah, um, the doctor and anytime, so I'm a huge Whovian. Um, the lamp that I actually have is the TARDIS um, and that's what's giving me this like weird glow. Um, but whenever you open the door, it makes the TARDIS sound. So, um, and I actually have a whole wall that's just dedicated to Doctor Who art, fan art. So um, this is my is tiny little Is it bigger on the inside? Huh? Is it bigger on the inside? Yes, it is. <laughs> and this, um, this little guy, Jen got for me, actually. Um, it, he came so in a cute. blind. Yeah, and I have a bunch of them um, because I'm a Whovian and I'm a nerd. But um, yeah, he's one of my favorites. And this is probably one of the most heartbreaking episodes in Doctor Who lore, if you're a Doctor Who and Rose fan, um, because this is when, um, spoiler alert, uh, she goes to another dimension and he can never see her again. Oh. Yeah, and anyway, with, oh, it does hurt <laughs> my heart, yes, so I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Jen. Hi guys, this is Jen, Jennifer. So my week has been kind of slow, like Tori, I have some meetings throughout the week, but you know, that's work related. In terms of what I've been doing for fun during the week, I've been watching a lot of TV, so like over the last two, three days, I've been catching up on some of the series that I've been following. So I'm still watching Hospital Playlist 
fantastic series. Go watch it. Um, I've been watching uh, Eternal Monarch with Lee Min Ho. Go watch it. He's so pretty in it. He cares about the storyline. He's just so pretty in it. <laughs> And there's a white horse. Like, yeah, it's worth it. And he wears a naval officer suit oh, in the yeah. latest episode. Like, it's really just nice. It's just like eye candy. Just go watch it, guys. Um, but I got into two, I did finish two new series that are actually really good. One of them is called Normal People on Hulu. Mm -hmm. So it's a, based on a best-selling novel, and it captures, like, the a love affair that kind of spans from high school to college, but what I ended up texting Brenda was just how, I think what I said was like, that was such a amazing, like great series. There were so, they had beautifully rendered performances there. It was just so visceral. It was so beautiful to watch. The direction was great. Mm -hmm. The acting was phenomenal. So I hope we get some like award love at some point because it was just, it's really a great series to watch and it's a bingeable series to watch as well. So like you want to just, it's 30 minutes for every episode. So you kind of just want to go through that entire ride of the relationship. So I would definitely recommend that that's on Hulu. The second one that I watched that I would recommend would be never have I ever it's by uh, Mindy Kaling. And it's such a really great show in terms of just demonstrating one, the, a teenage show, like an actual teenage show. Like it's not Riverdale where the actors are 30, <laughs> you know, <laughs> 30 and acting like so-called teenagers. I don't know what kind of teenagers those are, but I wasn't that teenager. So I was not that teenager. Not ever followed. I remember, right. no, I that remember teenager. when Winter Hill first appeared and they were all like in their mid 20s, early 30s. <laughs> You're like, what teenager looks like that? Because I was a teenager at the time and I remember I did not look anything like that. Right. And there's like a lot of great conversations out there about how like that adds to like body dysmorphia and just like yeah. how that just adds to like low self esteem among teenagers because you have these actors who like, are adults, bona fide adults who have more confidence because they have more life experience under their belts and they're acting in these scenarios that are so-called teen scenarios, right? So you kind of have this just love, like this level that you're not meeting, right? And it's they have a full makeup and hair team to make them look flawless. Right. Like. <laughs> right. like, so, you know, what's great about Never Have I Ever, the characters actually look like their age, right? They are doing a lot of teenage things or scenarios that are very teen scenarios. So there's one big episode around one of the lead um, boy characters who, you know, he was just having a really bad day. And he had, throughout the episode, he just kept walking around with this giant sit on his like chin, mm. like grows bigger, bigger. And like that just adds to this, just his experience, his bad experience for that day. And like, that is again, something that you experience as a teenager, right? But what makes the show, also interesting and I think relevant for us because we are so interesting in diverse casting is that it does follow the experience of an Indian teenage girl and what does that look like growing up in an Indian household and being an Indian one of the few in her high school environment and what does that mean for future prospects right so and what is a mom Indian daughter mom relationship look like mm -hmm. right and so I think that it captures a really nice niche there and a little nice experience there and it's a well done show again 30 minutes you can you could get it done in a day um yeah so that's i did right so it's definitely something that um you guys should all check out but one item that i want to display is this <gasps> so if you for those just listening to us this is a cufic figure um and it's displaying batman being carried by Superman through the clouds and obviously Batman has a very not excited face <laughs> and Superman is just happy to be flying his best friend around and it's one of it's a really great you know craftsmanship here and yeah. it's one of the gifts that Brenda got for me after visiting Comic-Con in San Diego yeah so thank you Brenda for that is it the same company that did your Hulk one yes I really like their figures. They have really cute yeah. figures. I, Hugh figs are really actually favorite. really nice. They're for, like, I like their realistic, yeah. uh, kind of, re like, realistic slash animated style. Yeah. And they're at affordable prices as well. 
So I used to love Funkos, and I still love Funkos, but at some point I kind of grew out of grew out of them, and I'm not collecting them anymore. So eventually I found Qfigs, which mm-hmm. I try not to collect as much because I don't have as much space, but I love their interpretations. They have a really nice, like, Harry Potter series, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you're interested in, like, figure correct collecting, I would recommend Qfigs for that reason, if you can't afford yet, like, the DC collectibles that are coming right, out the DC right. company. But yeah, so that's my little recap. Um, So like I said last week, we really want to focus this month around Asian stories. And especially because we're still in quarantine, we're still, you know, under orders to be safe at home. And, you know, it's, it's tough out there, I believe, for a lot of Asians who, you know, are afraid to cough in public for, for being for multiple reasons, right? Mm-hmm. And are trying to have a low profile. So we really wanna highlight a lot of their stories. We wanna highlight a lot of stories that we grew up with that are that represent Asian culture as well. And it also happens to be Asian Pacific Islander Month. So it's all fitting. Mm-hmm. So this whole month, we're going to be focusing on Asian stories from either Asian creators or Asian um, central characters. and. For today, we're going to be talking about one of our favorite shows growing up, Jackie Chan Adventures. Adventures! <laughs> one more thing! One more thing! <laughs> bad day, bad day, bad day. Bad day, bad day, bad day. <laughs> Can I just say though, all right, before we start, oh no, so I'll be I'm, later. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to pull up just a few images from just a random Google search for what Jackie Chan Adventures looks like. So Jackie Chan Adventures was a show that came out late 90s, early 2000s. Am I right? Um, yeah, that sounds about it, right. It, right. It's, it was a 30-minute comedy cartoon animated show mm-hmm. that starred Jackie Chan as an archaeologist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and... They went on adventures, basically, with, and were the one of the central part plots was that they had to collect these talismans based off the Chinese zodiac, mm-hmm. and he would, they had to go and recover them. And as every episode went on, you know, he was helped along the way by a few central characters, one being his niece Jade. So she's the young girl that's pictured in all the advertisements. She's she's usually wearing like this orange uh, yeah. hoodie, and like these capri jeans and his uncle who you know i think is not like uncle uncle it's just like an older older cousin older cousin older (laughs) relative that they just named uncle who's the antique shop owner that jackie works with as well and he's also a like he's into magic and it's a chi master and eventually they are joined by toru this japanese sumo wrestler type mm-hmm. henchman former henchman who gets eventually Very adopted into his family yeah. and he becomes a uh, uncle's apprentice and they there's also like a spy element to the show because jackie aside from being an archaeologist and like recovering objects from museums and working at this antique shop with his uncle he also because of this talisman quest gets to work with a government agency called section 13 and he gets confused. to work with agent black all the time i'm sorry not to be confused with her warehouse 13. <laughs> yeah not to be confused by warehouse 13 or what was it that alias show also had a 13 evil organization oh, right <laughs> yeah in the parts has organization 13. <laughs> there you go so many 13s out there <laughs> many 13s out there jackie started it all i don't know if he started it <laughs> very true very true so i kind of wanted to start off this conversation with with your impressions i well, all of us are re-watching the show right now so we yeah. but i really wanted to start off with how did you get into this what what are some childhood memories associated with growing up with jackie chan adventures yeah so for me i was before jackie chan adventures came out i was already a huge jackie chan fan um, I had watched, my dad loves martial arts movies. I used to watch martial arts movies with him. I did martial arts. 
Um, so we watched all the Jackie Chan movies, like just everything that was coming out of like, um, lost my words for a second. Um, everything <laughs> that was coming out of Hong Kong, basically that was Jackie Chan movies we were watching. Um, you know, we were laughing, watching. My, one of my dad's favorite movies of all time is Rush Hour. Like, I mean, it's later, but like my dad loved that movie. Like, it's just, my family was a big Jackie Chan fan in general. Um, and so when the show came out, it was just natural that we were like, oh, Jackie Chan Adventures, like, obviously we're going to watch this. Um, and we just started watching. I remember my brother and I were obsessed, like obsessed. And my older cousin, Alyssa, she was like, she's two, two, three years older than me. And she was just old enough to, she was like, this is so stupid, I don't like it. But then would watch every episode with us. <laughs> like, but, yeah, that's kind of how we got into it. I had a very similar experience to yours. Um, I think Rush Hour came out in 1998. Um, okay. And then Jackie Chan Adventures came out like a couple years after that. Um, but um, I, yeah, so I grew up watching a lot of Jackie Chan movies with yeah. my dad. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's an 80s thing. I think Jackie Chan was just a huge action star and it yeah. was the kind of, um, like my dad loves Bruce Lee and he loves Jackie mm -hmm. Chan. My dad too. Those, were, those would be the movies I grew up with. That and Clint Eastwood for some reason. I'm not, like I used to really like Clint Eastwood. I don't anymore, but um, I do remember like those were the three main figures that my dad would watch on like every time there's a movie we'd watch. And so um, I think Rush Hour was the first time I, actually really got into the movie right like I would watch it but it was always like on in the background right it wasn't like I was really into um the martial arts movies and it it was mostly because the movies in which um Bruce Lee would appear they were really intense right because they were really violent and the, the violence was always off-putting to me I didn't I didn't like it but I liked him right like I liked his character but it was always the villains who always kind of scared me. So I try to stay away from that. I always enjoyed Jackie Chan movies a lot more because they were a little lighter. And so I was a little kid, right? I was like, what, eight years old at the time. So Rush Hour really brought in like a lot of the humor and mm -hmm. put that at the forefront. So I really um, started gravitating more toward Jackie Chan at that moment. And so for me, it was very, it was a kind of the same thing, right? This was one thing that I could connect with my, my dad. Although he watched like a few episodes, but he didn't really enjoy it. So it was like, he's not a cartoon guy, um, but I liked it. And so I think one of the things that I really enjoyed was how campy it was and how light and yeah. happy and Jade. Jade was just such a revelation for me. And then Toru, when he became good, right? Spoiler yeah. alert. Um, there's just something about Toru and his, family dynamic that I just enjoy I don't even know why like his mother is a tiny little woman but she is a force of freaking nature <laughs> I, I I don't know there's so many women in my own family who are like these tiny little totems I think right they're tiny and yet they command the room when they walk in and so it was one of those things where I just I enjoyed it it was fun it was light and it was something that I could, and I like the most visceral um, memory that I have is just watching Ch uh, Jackie Chan Adventures while eating a quesadilla, right? Which is the weirdest thing I know, but like that was the first thing I learned how to cook on my own, right? So, because I could reach the stove and I would flip the tortilla without yeah. um, burning myself. I think that's right? one of the first things I learned to cook too. Yeah, because <laughs> it's easy, easy, it's cheap, and yeah. it, you can like make it in between commercial breaks right yeah, like you can yeah. run to the kitchen make it and then run back and eat it right and so that's really the thing that and we had a hammock at the time inside the house right so it was in our living room um so i would just sit on my hammock eating like just eating my quesadilla watching jackie chan adventures can't even tell you what episodes i would be watching i just remember the series and having such a enjoyable time right um, you know what though I, i'm so glad that you said don't even know what episode it was because i remember my brother and i because they would just kind of be on right you never knew and we would like watch the opening sequence and if like jackie was punching toru we knew it was yes. old and we'd like tap <laughs> out one, right but if he was punching <laughs> hawk Fu, you knew it was new and we we're like yes! yeah <laughs> <laughs> right no yes i remember having the same reaction right um and i remember the other like when it was what was the redhead guy's name i'm sorry Okay, so whenever he would, I never understood, like, why are you yelling the thing that you're going to attack them with? And why is it Yeah, but and I loved it. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It was, 
yeah, it was ridiculous. But yeah. How about you, Jen? What was your first uh, memory of Jack and Chan? Adventure? I don't even know. Like, I think it was just on when it was on, right? It was part of that Saturday morning yeah. light on the WB Fox, um, Channel 5 for us in, yep, in yep. Los Angeles. So it was just part of it. I was I was intrigued. I was like, okay, let's watch this. Like, it's, it's Jackie Chan. And so I ended up watching it, and I really and loved it. So, you know, as Tori kind of revealed in our podcast last week, you know, my dad is Chinese. And mm-hmm. so he, he, he actually immigrated to America when he was a teenager. And so he, you know, went through high school here and then, you know, grew up and, you know, had me. And so he's, he always brought Jackie Chan into my life. Like Jackie Chan is someone that like I grew up with, right. Uh, With all his movies. Um, And I grew up with other like, my dad loves action movies. Like if we go out to movie theaters nowadays, it's like, is that an action movie or what? Like, otherwise I'm not interested. (laughs) I'm like, but dad, it's like, it's Marvel and I kind of want to go watch it, but it's not like action though. (laughs) But it is action. Things blow up and people fight. And yeah. so, you know, he loves action movies and he brought that to our family life. And, you know, for that reason, I got exposed. And like my mom also, she's Salvadorian. So I'm, I'm, I'm of mixed heritage. So I'm both Chinese and Salvadorian. And, you know, I, I always tell these guys, like, I had a very mixed experience. It's not that I grew up solely in one culture or solely in the other. It's, I had a very mixed experience. One of my favorite things to share out to them and to people is like for to show just visualize for them just how mixed it was I would grow up like with a dinner plate of it's of a dinner plate of like dumplings (laughs) from what my dad would have brought right dumplings that my mom made and then I would also have frijoles con queso on the side (laughs) (laughs) and then I would have like a soda because that's something American. So like, again, I grew up with a very mixed palette. It's not like I grew up in one culture strongly over the other. It was all very fused together. And for that reason, I feel, and a lot of times I feel more American than I do one or the other, right? Because I had that very mixed experience. But, you know, for whatever reason, Jackie Chan was a unifying force for my family in in his action movies, because they would also be playing a lot on TV, like, broadcast television and the Spanish channels particularly would love to like play them and like play them with dubs so my mom would watch that I remember her laughing her ass off when we were watching that Jackie's drunken master drunken master yeah yeah and she would just laugh and laugh and again it's she was laughing at his comedic timing about the martial arts. She also likes action movies. And so I grew up with a lot of that. And so when Jackie Chan Adventures came on, I obviously, you know, I'm someone, you know, that didn't see a lot of myself on TV, right? And so mm-hmm. when I saw that, I'm like, Jackie Chan, yeah! Um, I, I immediately gravitated. And then it also incorporated this element of the Chinese horoscope, which I was obsessed with. And I, I think I still... I'm slightly obsessed with it. See, there's a poster in the background that's the Chinese zodiac in my back, <laughs> in my bedroom. It's actually something I got when I was like seven or eight from like this wing hot funk store or something. I got that name wrong. It's actually a true store. It's a real store. But, you know, so I like that what the show did really well is that history element together with like that Chinese element overlaid with this action element overlaid with this like comedic element so I really enjoyed that and then my dad find out, found out about the show because you know he saw he wouldn't necessarily be with me all the time he you know he worked a lot so he would come in and out of my life and so what happened to be a Saturday he would and he would see that I watching cartoons he saw that I was watching Jackie Chan and it's one of those things where like he would also watch with me so it's one of those nice little memories that I have where he would like sit down and watch because he loves Jackie Chan he loves anything Chinese and so he'd be laughing his butt off right alongside me um, as I was watching it so it it really was something that I grew up with and I I have such a special place in my heart for because it's something that is a warm place and a warm memory for me and I think Tori brought it up earlier in a previous conversation is I don't know what it is but like a lot of like our 
our heroes, our childhood heroes, are archaeologists. And so this is something yeah. like <laughs> I wanted to be an archaeologist because Me Jack too. Was an archaeologist because in the, because relic hunter Sydney Fox was an archaeologist, and because you know Molly um, Oliver becomes an archaeologist, Jackie Chan, Indiana I Jones. Remember <laughs> whenever Zena came into like the future, like she would be an archaeologist as well. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. I, you know what? I, I think it's because it's that combination. And let's let's face it, you guys. Ultimately, we all became teachers at yeah. college, right? And yeah. I think all these archaeologists <laughs> have that, right? Um, at That's least the three of them. Um, and when the, the, those are the things, right? There's like free time for you to go out there and explore, right? And so there's an element of mystery, but there's also the stability of like teaching younger generations. And so, mm -hmm. like, there's a lot of there's the nobility that comes with trying to understand the past to make way for a better future mm -hmm. that I think comes with that career path um but it also was just like the career of the 90s right like yeah. I think that was like <laughs> the cool thing to be and I blame Indiana Jones for that I don't know maybe I think too I, if I'm recalling correctly it's been a few years but on the exact same channel card capture Sakura um card captors yeah. was playing yeah. and I'm pretty sure her dad was an archaeologist but yes. teaching now instead of he wasn't going in the field anymore um, yes. Like, I don't know. It was, and even I'm not like okay. I know this is actually one of your fandoms, but like in Stargate, the main guy, the main civilian guy, is an archaeologist, and you're just like, why? It's just, yeah, I don't it's know. just a go-to like catch-all career, I think. Right? It's like let's do some like action. I think mm -hmm. again, I think very inspired by Indiana Jones, right? Yeah. It's like you know, um, who kind of had these like great movies come out and very like well attended movies come out mm -hmm. and so I think that's part of why we saw that a lot of people trying to re recapture that magic but it also inspired like all, all, of, all of us nerds to want to do stuff like that in the mm -hmm. future well then I'm very like I'm not a Star Wars nerd but then but I know it was a huge thing so now I'm bitter that Jedi is not an actual career path that we can all follow because I would like a laser sword thingy <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, I'm still waiting for my morpher, guys. I'm like, I'm still Wait. waiting. Wait, we need to decide on a morpher because I've got cosplays to buy. It's just so. That's yeah. true. I mean, something that's like three colors, ideally, right? And then we have to decide who gets to be like the leader. <laughs> you guys realize, so if they weren't an archaeologist, then they were a journalist. That's it was true. That's two, true. Right? Like it that's was, true. yeah. Yeah, a historian of some sort. Yeah. 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 And to this day, I, I really do enjoy stories that have like a historian mm -hmm. or kind of career path or background because I love the, the librarians for that reason. It's four historians going out and going after like these ancient artifacts of magic stuff. <laughs> and I think that's why Brenda likes Warehouse 13. Love it. And Eureka, but Eureka is not necessarily history, it's more sciencey people. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, you know, for us, like, I think what we're getting at is that Jackie Chan had, were, was a unifying yeah. force for both children and adults alike. It, it was a unifying oh. force. Like, I kept, I keep mm. saying it because I think it's the effect that Jackie Chan had yes. on our The family. Jackie Chan effect, if you will. Huh? Yeah. Jackie Absolutely. Chan effect, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I, I want to go back to something that you said earlier, Jen, about um, your dinner plate being dumplings and frijoles, right? Because that's kind of the thing that I found myself eating as I was rewatching it this week, right? Uh -huh. um, like frijoles con queso y tortilla, right? And I'm just watching it and I'm like, this doesn't match what I'm watching, right? <laughs> um, and I say that because oftentimes what will happen, especially if I'm watching like an anime or... Um, Really anything, because it happened to me with Eureka too. I'd be watching something, I'm like, oh, that looks so good. I want to eat what they're eating, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so it, there's this really weird association that I have and probably unhealthy <laughs> association that I have with like TV yeah. and food, right? It's not necessarily the snack, but it like sparks something in me to want to cook whatever it is that I'm seeing on TV, right? And so 
the association that I have with frijoles and quesadillas, right, are just like, those are the things that are already made at home, right? And it's easy eating, right? Because I can just grab it and go because it's readily available to me. And I think, um, I don't know, that's the closest equivalent that I'll have to American kids. Um, and I, I, I am an American. Um, I was born and raised here. But like, I guess white kids have with like Lunchables and um, like cookies and stuff, right? Um, for me, it's a little different, right? It's quesadillas and frijoles. But those are the things that also spark the memories, right? Because I'll be eating that and I'll be remembering like, oh, I used to watch Pokemon when I'd be eating this or I'd be watching um, mm -hmm. Jackie Chan Adventures. Mm -hmm. And particularly mm -hmm. with Jackie Chan Adventures, I think you touched on it, Tori. It's just, it was just on all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is while there were other cartoons available at the time, one of the things that I think is Jackie Chan's um, strength, not just the comedy and the writing, right? But it's also the art, the art, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I think Mucha Libre or something like, Lucha something came out yeah. after that. And I remember watching it and trying to give it oh, a shot. Lucha, Lucha. Lucha, Lucha, whatever it was. Lucha, Lucha, yeah. I try to give it a shot because there were kids speaking Spanish, right? It's my first language. So I'm like, oh yeah. And then I watched it and I was really bored. I hated the art. I, I hated the stories. But there's something inviting about Jackie Chan Adventures art, right? Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes you'll notice that the scenery or the sets don't look complete, right? They'll be colored in and this is like an outline. But that isn't, that's part of what makes it so inviting, right? Because the character, the the focus is the characters and how they move, right? And so I think that's one of the things that made me really enjoy the series is the focus is on them and all the shenanigans that they get into, right? Particularly with lot. Jade and, yeah, yeah with the talismans, because, you know, Jade's a, how old is she? She's really young. Yeah, 10-ish? Like, like, I want to think she's about 10, yeah. But she doesn't listen to authority, and she's always trying to get in with um, Section 13 because she wants to be a double, uh, uh, agent when she grows up, right? Oh, yeah. All of us wanted to be, right? I, I don't know about you, but um, I really like the idea of being a secret agent, much like um, the characters in the series. But with Jade, it was always running, 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 but it was always focused on her, right? Rather than the backdrop of all the magic that was happening. What That's I not to love... say that it wasn't important, but it just wasn't the focus as much as the characters. Yeah, there's an episode I really love with Jade where um, it's when they get the rooster talisman and she, it lands in her soup and she doesn't realize and she swallows it. And Jackie goes, during the whole time, he's like, you need to chew your food. And she's like, how do you chew soup? <laughs> like, and, um, <laughs> like, and, and then she like, Jackie's like, how did you not realize like there was a talisman in your soup? Like it's not small. And she's like, you don't chew soup. <laughs> like, and it was just like, she would just like say something that would just crack me up. Like, um, I, I think there's a lot of just characters on that show that crack me, crack me up. I remember that uncle was just so, and to this day, like rewatching it, so he's funny. so funny. And his catchphrase of one more thing. One more thing. He like hits you on the head. <laughs> I don't know why, but I'm like suddenly remembering that my dad and I would like have that as a back and forth growing up. Yeah. Like he would just be like, one more thing to me. <laughs> And my like, brother and I would do it to each other all the time too. We'd yell, one more thing! <laughs> like, yeah. Um, because I felt like it was so real. Like, I just felt like I could see this character in real life. Like, right. He was just, I know it was like comedic. I love how, like, right. at first he wanted to have like a really big role, mm -hmm. but as soon as like the episodes kept rolling out, they found out, okay, this guy, this character is really funny. Like, we need to bring him yeah. up a little bit more. He needs to be a little bit more in the scene and I remember just recently I just watched the episode where Jade casts a really bad magic spell and turns everyone into children and <laughs> and she has she has to suddenly be the quote-unquote adult because they're yeah. all younger than her and she turns Jackie and the Jade team into children and then she uh, turns uncle into a child as well and uncle's like doing these magic things and he's all like I'm going to go cast the magic spell but first you have to take me to go get ice cream <laughs> and the <laughs> agent black guy is like the agent black character is like what ice cream but we need to it's like no first ice cream <laughs> <laughs> so basically he's always been uncle is what you're saying yes <laughs> I love the running gag too where like 
someone will say something mean to uncle, like, like a bad guy or something. And Jade's like, don't talk to my uncle like that. At least I think he's my uncle, right? <laughs> and like, well, I think you can say it. Yeah. How big our families get, right? Um, yeah. And I used to think this was a Latino thing, but I think in talking to you guys and talking to more people and thinking, I'm starting to feel like that's one of the unifying things among yeah. people of color, right? Our families kind of get away from us in the sense mm -hmm. that they always are bigger than who we think, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's like, oh, do you know that uncle from who right. freaking knows right and it might not be blood relation right it might just be a right. friend like you know when jen has children they better call me aunt right like i'll be on yeah. right um but that's just kind of like that's how you kind of just adopt people into the family mm -hmm. um and i think that's that's the running joke here right um right yeah i, I don't know it's yeah yeah and like happens. with italians and croatians which are my two halves um it's very common to call all older cousins that are significantly older uh, uncle or aunt, basically, um, because yeah, it's just I to call you. Yeah, I call my mom's cousins deals, right? And yeah, I call my niece Mia my niece, even though she's technically like my second or third cousin, but she's right. my niece. Like, I have no other way to like indicate her. Right, I think that's very common, like, friendly yeah. but among our families, right? I don't have that large of a family. I come from a very smaller family mm. by virtue of just like there's, I don't have many siblings, like I have half siblings. Um, mm. I grew up as an own child um, mm. and I didn't have that connection with those siblings. They're much older than me for a long time. They didn't know I was there. Um, and so it was, you know, and then the families that I do have are in different countries. I didn't really grow up with them either, but I know that my mom also feels very much like you two, where she's like, that is really the, her third cousin, but she refers to them as uncle, right? Or she mm -hmm. refers to them as cousin, or she just refers to them as aunt. So it's very common. And I remember, you know, in, in graduate school, like I remember just asking for a lot of like You're breaking clarifying up questions, like, what do you mean? Like, she's your cousin, but me. Oh, there we go. I think I'm back. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. You're back. Okay. Um, I remember in graduate school, I would always ask Tori those clarifying questions. Yeah. Of, like, what do you mean? Like, she's your niece, but she's really your third cousin. And so I was always <laughs> like, that, like, that line, that ancestry yeah. line. Uh, but I think that, you know, the show itself did a really nice job of just making that a little bit more visible and making that more normalized that like these older cousins, these elders in your family are going to be <laughs> referred to in these kind of roles. Yeah. Right. And in Croatian, they eventually graduate from aunt and uncle into grandparents. Like I have a Nona Maria, who's like my grandmother Maria, but she's technically my great aunt. Um, but she's my cousin's aunt and it's disrespectful to like not call her like, no, no, that's her title. Like, it's, it's like a title more than a, like, it's very confusing, yeah. but I just know how to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Going back to the catchphrases, um, I don't know about you guys, but in this rewatch, I think I texted Tori about this where I'm like, I didn't, I can't believe that um, Jackie Chan's bad day, bad day, bad day didn't catch on as viscerally as one more thing, right? Um, <laughs> But I connected with um with his bad day, bad day, bad day on such a emotional, like deep level that I can't even describe it, you guys. Cause the first time I saw it, I'm like, yeah, Jackie, mood, total mood, right? And then as it kept happening, I'm like, man, this guy's just he just gets my soul, right? Like he's doing all the things that he can to try and have some kind of stability or sense of calm right and to try to deal with all the things and like just keeps throwing things at him right and it just I, I don't know I, I felt like it just captured our current state of the world and I think our constant state of oh there's one more thing I need to do oh crap there's another thing I have to do right even if you're at home right and it feels like a slow day there's always something to catch up on or yeah. to do and so that adds to that bad day bad day bad day right and I just really really enjoyed that that's something that I really enjoyed about the show, too, is that characterization of Jackie Chan, right? Yeah. But that's kind of what I tried to bring up a little bit earlier, too, is there's Jackie Chan, the man, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
all that he is now and all like his politics and everything, right? But then there's the Jackie Chan effect and the Jackie Chan yeah. character that I think still kind of brings such positivity and is such a grounding, you know, and foundational force for all of us mm -hmm. three here. I don't know about everyone else, but just for us three, you know, we, I, for me, it separated the man and then what he contributed as a creative person to the yeah. world, right? And yeah. as a character on the show, what I enjoyed was that Jackie wasn't and isn't perfect in his mm -hmm. martial arts, right? He always tumbles and bumbles and it always seems like he's trying hard. Like it's not like he, he does the moves and he takes on the bad guy effortlessly and he's like pristine he's always shown on the show to always throw a second punch or throw a second kick because it's harder to take down someone yeah. right and that he's struggling and he's kind of out of breath and it you know it requires a lot of effort on his side even if he's really gifted with martial arts mm -hmm. and you know he's kind of like a butter butter ball right and like butter fingers in a way and klutzy he's kind of klutzy for being so agile and acrobatic and he's also someone who's a bumbling person who just mm -hmm. you know he wants to explain things some but he can't explain things very clearly and that it, to me that was he's always been very real for that reason is because he he isn't this perfect character even though he has he has the these amazing abilities and he he carries that kind of trait across his films as well where mm -hmm. he's this effervescent person that is you know he has these natural abilities but it's it's almost as if he doesn't believe in himself or doesn't like mm -hmm. it's not like he's arrogant about it that's what it is he isn't arrogant and his character and i that demonstrated in, in his character on the show i don't know if you guys also felt that way yeah i i loved it i loved everything about it i like that he really pushed to because um i mean just growing up in martial arts um like and Jackie Chan fishes this in the show a lot, is that, you know, these martial arts, you're not supposed to use them to hurt people, right? They're self-defense, and they'll always and forever be self-defense, not to enforce on other people. Um, and I like that that's a major theme that he pushes, especially as Jade is learning Kung Fu, right? Um, because, like, there's that episode with the bully, right, and, like, she beats him up, and, like, Jackie's like, that's unacceptable. Like, I don't care that he's your bully. Like, that's, like, unless it's self-defense, you can't just go hit him. Like, um. And let's not forget that the show also kind of pushed this educational yeah. agenda forward, right? Every episode ends with a Get to Know Jackie segment. Yeah, and yeah, shares I love those. Nice experience and then also kind of advice, right? And mm -hmm. he does talk a lot about growing his him growing up, why he decided to put the show together, why... He does what he does. So, like, he, I remember him explaining why he does the stunts that he does, right? And how, like, he just wants to be involved in that process. Otherwise, it feels, like, unreal for him, right? Mm -hmm. And he also talked a lot about, like, what he can and cannot do as a result of those stunts. Like, he's right. like, I've broken this. I've broken, my, like, my toes. I've broken my, like, shins or whatever. And now I can't jump as high anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know that feeling. <laughs> Brenda, you're on mute. Sorry about that. There was an ambulance. Um, no problem. I, I didn't want you guys to hear that. Um, one of the things that I think this series did really well, and I'll be honest with you guys, I haven't followed Jackie Chan's career at all after Jackie Chan Adventures, um, just because, I don't know, that was just it. And although I like the Rush Hour series, I think I watched Rush Hour 2 and that was it. Um, so I'm really not familiar with what happened to him or where he ended up. I've seen a few stories in the media about what he's done, but I've never um, cared enough to click on them just because I'm teaching and I'm like everything I read, I have to be kind of selective about what I read right. um, because there's just so much. Um, there gets a point where like, there's just a lot that you're reading, right? So um, for me, this is just kind of, this kind of just exists in a bubble um, where I enjoyed it as a kid and I still going back to it now I really enjoyed the series I think the series is, has aged really well um, but not in 
Like it's just, you know, when you go back to a series and there's just jokes in there that they're not funny, right? They're just, you understood that they were funny at the time or they were considered funny, but yeah. they were at the expense of someone else. I don't necessarily feel that way with this series, right? I feel like it's something that you can watch with your children in mm-hmm. 10 years from now and it'll be okay, right? Um, just because it's light and funny and campy and it just does a good job of getting there. One of my favorite things is, um, and I, I kept, um, texting these two about it all week uh, was Valmont, right? Just yeah. as a character. Part of it is because Julian Sands um, voices the character. So that's another thing I think they did really well with the voice cast. Um, mm. They cast the appropriate characters. And Valmont actually ends up as like a bus driver at the end of the series. He goes from being like this head, um, like the head of this crime syndicate to like, yeah, he's not that dangerous anymore. Um, so <laughs> there's that. But Julian Sands also played Jor-El on Smallville, right? And so every time I heard his voice, it was one of those things. It's like, where have I heard this man's voice, right? And so I just enjoy his voice. He has that kind of soothing thing where you know he's evil because he's a British guy on an American <laughs> TV show, right? So obviously he has to be evil or if not, he has to be the brightest person in the room. It's one of the two. It can't be both. Right. But it's just there's a silliness. And between the three of them, Jackie, Agent Black and Valmont, I think there's a very interesting relationship going on there where Agent Black is just kind of that soothing, calm energy. Jackie Chan is uh, trying to balance everything at the same time guy. And then Valmont is just like, let's just toss a grenade in here and see what happens kind of deal. Right. Um, and so I just really enjoy watching the three of them on screen and listening to their to their voices because again, all three of them are so soothing in a really bizarre way. Like I would just put on an episode and fall asleep listening to their voices because it was just calming. <laughs> yeah, I like how you were just saying that it was a light show and it's enjoyable now. Ten like twenty. 15 years later, who knows, right? Don't but, age me, please don't. <laughs> don't age us, Jen, you don't know me. Sorry, but it did come out like in 1999. Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it did, it is such an enjoyable show. It's something very light. And that's why I think it's withstanding time because it's coming in with this very pure intention. It's yeah. coming in with this very just educational intention just to make us laugh to unite and it it doesn't have a greater agenda that is only narrowly focused on one timestamp, right it's something that can apply it to all what i really enjoyed about the show was just again the inclusion of a lot of asian his mythology yeah so you know the first two seasons heavily focus heavily on the talismans and the chinese horoscope so you get and they do it in such an enjoyable, palatable way that, you know, we're chasing mm-hmm. down talismans and they each have their own powers. I think I was really obsessed with uh, the horse and I was really obsessed with the dog, right? And I was really obsessed with finding out when they were going to get to those episodes. But they did it in such a way that was enjoyable to kind of be on this journey with them. Mm-hmm. And then at some point, like towards the later seasons, they started to include uh, Japanese mythology with the Oni because that becomes the bad guy so only. Um, yeah. And so you, you get Toru's kind of Japanese background embedded into the show as well. And I remember there being a conflict there too it, with Toru and, and Uncle as this master apprentice relationship and how, you know, Uncle, there's this episode where Toru is kind of leading a charge because he knows more about J- Japanese mythology mm-hmm. and Uncle feels a little left out. And so he's... He's at this airport and he tells the team, okay, so I'm going to go leave now and go back to the antique shop. And they're like, uncle, why? He's like, well, I'm tired and stuff. And they kind of had to pry, think, pry it out of him. But he reveals that, you know, he doesn't know Japanese mythology as well as Toru. And he feels like he's just getting in the way. And he feels useless. And he doesn't want to let the team down. And it's one of those growth moments and character development moments for Uncle as well. So it's not just a show with just static characters. There are, you know, these dynamic, very even small dynamic moments in the character development for the show. And that I really enjoyed. Yeah, and I think ultimately it becomes a show about family, right? Um, 
it, but it's not the traditional family, right? Because it's two men trying to figure out how to raise this 10 year old kid who just won't listen to any of them, right? Yeah, I and love so their relationship so much too. Like, yeah, it's the makeshift family, right? It just became a family out of need. And I think given the fact that um, this was in, you know, uh, early 2000s, um, seeing a non-traditional family, mm -hmm. um, not in the sense that we think of it now, but even just non-traditional in that these aren't her parents uh, raising right. her, right? It's two uh, men at very different stages in their lives who are raising this kid and a community forms around them, right? Mm -hmm. um, Toru comes in, even Agent Black and all of them right have there. a hand raising this kid, right? Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that I really enjoyed about the series in seeing how easy it is, well, not easy, uh, easy it is to form a family and form those um, relationships but also how difficult it is to rear a child, right? Because especially yeah. one who won't listen. Absolutely. Yeah. And Jade was a handful. And I love, you know, you, you know, I love how you brought her into the conversation earlier, you know, and I want to spend some time on Jade. It's just how incredible it was to have a female lead. Yeah. A, you know, an Asian female lead. Be part and no hair girl. streak. <laughs> right and no hair streak i mean cool asian haircut though cool asian haircut but no asian hair streak <laughs> no asian hair streak for those um, who are unaware the asian hair streak is this trend that shows up in a lot of Amer a lot of american made um shows and media they put this when an asian woman is air quote non-conforming to she's non-traditional meaning she's not you know in her kimono all the time and things like that they usually add a hair streak color to her hair usually a red a blue a purple to signify that she is not you know air quote traditional um, and it's all over and jade doesn't have that and i love it great right. her hair like i, I love her hair like that <laughs> But she was also so interesting to me, like looking back retrospectively, right? She's so interesting because she's brash. She's not, she's also not quote unquote the stereotypical I, Asian. She I, hates I, homework. Yeah, she's <laughs> she hates face. homework. She does not get good grades. She just constantly wants to be out and about with her uncle on these adventures. She doesn't listen to her parent, to her parental figures very well. Right. And she's not like this meek child at home. And she is brash, she's independent, she's very strong-willed, and she does, she has her own mind. And it was, it's incredible to have such a strong female lead at the forefront, because at some point, at some point she becomes more centralized, yeah. and she's more of a central figure than Jackie Chan himself. Right. Yes, totally agree. And add to that total style icon, because... <laughs> She had this fisherman's hat at in one episode that I totally got for myself. And then the hoodie, the hoodie itself was something I always wanted because it was like, it wasn't quite. So Jen, do you remember that um, I used to have, okay, so this is a Target story actually. So I used to have like this blue thing that looked, it was a zip up hoodie, but it wasn't really a hoodie because it was like short sleeved. But it was one of those things where it was like, oh, this kind of looks like Jade, right? And I think about my my dress and how I like, cause I was very tomboyish. Um, I think I modeled a lot of it after Jade, right? Um, I always wanted her cargo pants, um, but I could never pull it off because I'm a little on the chubby side. So um, I couldn't do like the roll up thing, or at least I didn't have the confidence to do it, right? I think I could have pulled it off, but I just didn't cause you know, um, self-conscious and shit. But total style icon, I think for um, the 2000s uh, teenage, mm -hmm tomboy i think just because she just got it right it was just such a cool thing it's so easy to move in the clothes that she was wearing now i'm thinking we should cosplay as jade but you know whatever. <laughs> actually if we do cosplay as um jackie chan um adventures characters dibs on jade <laughs> <laughs> i love how every time jade goes to school it's like at the lunch yard and she's like and there was these shadow con and then shen do and they're all the kids are like what is wrong with you you lie so much she's like i'm not lying <laughs> well and then when she is telling them about the shadow ninjas right they're like and she's about they're about to appear and then the bell rings and you're like oh yeah. i right, want like, you to see that she's not lying yeah <laughs> and that's why we Jade was so important. Like it was so important to see someone like that on the screen for me growing up. Just seeing someone that looked like me, someone that was not fitting into the 
the box that mm -hmm. society wanted me to fit into, right? Because she also didn't look incredibly stereotypically Asian. Mm -hmm. You know, for someone who, you know, immigrated into to America because she's actually originally from China, she's very American and, you know, it is an American show. So I'm sure that, that also played into from it. Hong Kong, actually. And then when I rewatched it, Jackie was like, oh, like you're fresh off the boat. Like, do you speak English? And she doesn't respond because she's being Jade. So he starts mm -hmm. like saying hello to her in Chinese and she's like, oh, whatever. Like, right. <laughs> um, yeah, like I totally forgot about that because she is so American, it feels like. Right, and you know, intentional, not intentional, or very insensitive, who knows, right? Like, but at least for me, as someone that was growing okay. up in this very mixed mixed environment, like that was important for me to see on the screen. Mm -hmm. Someone, obviously I'm not like Jade, I'm actually an introvert. I think she's an extrovert by nature. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it was important to see someone in that role and being in, in a role that was informative and educational and formative for me. And I think it was for many people, regardless of background. And I think the, sh the word that I was looking for earlier is that the show was so wholesome. That's what it was, it's wholesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what's really been really enjoyable about rewatching the show now. Which is a shame that it's not being pushed out like for a very long time, I know that it wasn't available on DVD. It wasn't available on streaming. It only recently came out on streaming, like all five seasons. And I think they're available on Amazon Prime yeah. for like for cheap price. Like it's super, like the first season was like $4.99 for, for a bunch of episodes. Yeah, so I was just really upset that it wasn't available for a very long time. And it's, it's a shame. I, th I think it, it could have really helped this younger generation as well. Yeah. I hope that many others go and watch it because it's really, it's great. I have a I dream. Of, go, ahead. go ahead, Brenda. No, you go ahead. Okay. I was say I have this like total like Jackie Chan dream that will one day get a reboot where Jackie is now uncle, Jade is now Jackie, and she's like super like well to do in uh, uh, section 13. And then there's a new child now that is the Jade. And she has her own little Jade that she has to contend with. Yes. And it's just like Jackie yelling one more thing and smacking Jade all the time. And her thinking she knows everything because she lived this experience and this new little brat. And she's like, just stay home. And then, ja then Jackie as uncle is like, you never did. <laughs> like, and like, it's just be so great. See, and I think, I love that plan, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, so let's start a petition to get Tori writing that series. Oh, I would love it. <laughs> I want to add to what you're saying, what you're saying, Jen, about the availability of this um, series, right? Because for a long time, and I, I spent years not watching it because yeah. it wasn't available. Not even um, on YouTube. And I know that you and I started watching it around the same time this last week, right, Tori? And yeah. we were both having the same reactions, right? It was just like, oh man, this is so light. This is lovely. This is just a good watch. And I think about a lot of the cartoons that we grew up with, right? We had Animaniacs. We had um, Gargoyles, right? Gargoyles oh, is another series. Gargoyles. So well done that it is such a shame that it wasn't readily available to us, right? Like I bought season two before season one was available um, on DVD. And it's just one of those sad things because I go back and watch Gargoyles and I'm blown away by how well it was done, right? I love that voice. I, movie on I love the stories. The stories themselves are so diverse and so well done. Yeah. Um, that I, I don't know, I, it's one of those things. And I realized, oh, the reason why I loved Riker from Star Trek is because of Gargoyles, because I grew up with Gargoyles, not Star Trek. So it was just one of those, this is those really nice connecting moments, yeah. right? Same thing with, um, with Jackie, right? Um, I, Belmont, I love Jor-El's voice, but it's because of Smallville, right? But no, I watched him on, on Jackie Chan Adventures mm -hmm. first. And so it's just really nice, kind of full circle of my nerddom. But I also think it, these are really important stories to watch, right? Because yeah. you're teaching children all of these um, important lessons, but while maintaining some sense of community between all these characters. And so, Absolutely. I'm sorry, these characters, but also with each other, right? Within our own families, make, building those connections. Um, you know, all of us have those stories with our dads who love Jackie Chan in some way, shape, or form. So I think these are so lovely 
and hopefully we'll have them if we ever do have children to you know yeah force them to like and enjoy the same nerd stuff that we like gargoyles is on disney plus i recently binged yeah. the whole thing yep okay, same yeah. so, i yeah. can get into that but yeah i you know jack i remember this one episode and i recently just rewatched it as well was jade comes back jade from the future comes back into the past and to help resolve this this issue or dilemma that's going to affect the future and so she comes this older jade comes back and she helps out and one of the party lines that you know before she goes back into the future that jackie tells jade is just in case i want to tell you i'm i'm proud of you and who you became and that just heart swell and <laughs> right just so much love there but it's one of those like brenda said like despite our backgrounds, right, because we all come from very diverse backgrounds, what the, sh what the show demonstrates is that, you know, communities look alike in a lot of, even though community looks, looks, communities look very different and have different experiences, there are common experiences that all unite us as people. So I think one of the one important things that the show was able to do is just sh share out a history and a mythology that is different from, you know, what you're experiencing at home and make that viable and like interesting for some, for others, right? And do it from a platform of, we all have these common experiences. We have that crazy uncle in our family. We have that, <laughs> we have the uncle that's like very like, make into like making sure that we're okay and that, you know, we do the right thing all along, right? And we have this mishap kind of, you know, cousin or, you know, niece that just gets into trouble all the time. Yeah. Right. And so by showing us that these are common experiences, but here's also like some other history and other mythology that you should be exposed to. And, you know, so that you are, you grow up with more of a diverse upbringing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, yeah, I just, I loved Jackie Chan. I, I love have a the question show. about talismans for everybody. So, two questions. First, what's your Chinese zodiac so we'd know what your actual power is? And then the second one is, which talisman would you pick? I am a horse. Um, okay. I would probably pick the dragon one. Nice. I am also a horse. And I need more time to think about what talisman I would pick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, okay, so I never, because I, I feel like this one gets different renditions. Um, I'm ram, goat, sheep? Yeah, the ram. Oh, ram, okay, yeah, I wasn't sure, because I think it's sheep on Jackie Chan Adventure. Um, yeah, but you're the ram. Is it pretty much interchangeable, Jen? Um, it's sheep? interchangeable. Okay. Cool, yeah, I, that's the one I am, um, I think. Um, I'm pretty sure. Yes, My brother's are. rooster, and I always mix up because we had the beanie babies of the Chinese when they did the Chinese zodiac beanie babies. Um, and I remember my mom got us, Santa got us both of them. And um, I, I always forgot whose was whose because we just kind of had like a bucket that they all lived in. Um, but I think my, I would probably have the rooster as a power because I want to fly. I'd probably mix rooster and bunny so I could fly super fast. <laughs> <laughs> I could see this. Yes, you're also, as a Zodiac expert, you are the Ram. You are not the person. <laughs> um, I think I'm an Earth Ram or something like that. If, yeah, I think it had me do a thing and I was an Earth Ram. Yeah, Brenda and I are both metal horses. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> see, I'm really into Zodiac stuff because any anything Zodiac, I'm going to, Chinese Zodiac, I'm really going to research yeah. and into and have a fun time with part of it's because I didn't like I might have revealed this in previous recordings but I don't speak Chinese mm. I grew up with my dad sure and I grew up with a lot of Asian food in my life but I also felt very displaced and isolated because I didn't speak Chinese to this day I don't you know I still feel that I'm more comfortable interacting in those spaces than I was when I was a child but I always felt like an outsider looking in because I even though I feel Chinese in that, in my heritage, mm -hmm. over my you know Latinx identity, I would say like that's kind of my Chinese pull is 
more there than my Latinx. Even though like I'm with my mom every day and I grew up with her more, I just, I think I just feel more of a connection with my Chinese self. But overall, like my American self beats both of them out. <laughs> But so anything Chinese, I really gravitated to. I really enjoy. So like I, I the Chinese zodiac was one way to get into that. So mm -hmm. that's why I really love that. That's why I have that big poster in the background. I have a bunch of horse Chinese horse figurines in my room. I can actually pull one down. Yeah, I want to see one. Yeah, I just like revealed a really terrible thing. So this is one oh, that I have. It's so cute. I have many of these in my room. I need to get some notes. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first time I ever went to Jen's house, it was the first thing that caught my eye because she had so many horses, right? And so I asked her, so are you, so you're into the Chinese Zodiac and that's how we start. I, I think that was one of the first conversations we had as friends, right? Um, mm. Talking about her figurines. Yeah. It's, and she loves I, fruit baskets, if anyone knows what fruit baskets is, because it features, it's Japanese, but it features the Chinese zodiac heavily, and she's rolling to it. <laughs> yes, yes, I feel very seen right now. <laughs> I, I, I like that you brought up, though, like, feeling like an outsider in cultures, because as someone who also grew up with a lot of languages around me, um, I, I don't fully, I don't have any type of, like, fluency like yeah I can like like yeah volante I love you like but like you know what I mean like it's not like there's no mastery at all nowhere even near sure I can count to eight like but that's like you know what I mean like yeah, I can I ask I like for beer like 50 people <laughs> bring me two beers like because that's what I would be told but like um you know but things like that like I but I and I felt very disconnected even though I feel like I have strong ties um but yeah no I'm glad that you brought that up because you're not alone in feeling like that especially for a lot of kids who grew up kind of immersed in these languages that don't speak them but are surrounded by them which is what I love that Jackie Chan did in the show is because he did it he and uncle did not try to cover their accents at all and right. I grew up with accents all around me um and I really enjoyed that he spoke, Jackie speaks his true authentic English, right? Uncle speaks his true authentic English. They're not like, they're not trying to speak, you know, air quote, you know, like a native. They're like. There's no struggle to understand them, right? Yeah. Um, Jade understands them perfectly and they can communicate with that. Like the, the miscommunication that occurs yeah. is based on age, not language, right? And I right. think that's one of the things that I do love about this series is there's no emphasis on the proper way to speak any right. language, right? It's an emphasis on these are our ideals in this generation. These are our ideals in this generation. This is the ideals on this generation. How do you communicate with each other based on that, right? And I think that's one of the things that I love about this series and why I say it's so grounded in family, right? Because any miscommunication that occurs, occurs because Jade is young and she wants to be out there. And these guys are concerned with their safety. And so there's these clashes that happen, but they're not rooted in, oh, you speak a funny version of the language that right. I'm trying to communicate, right? right? And that's the thing that I appreciate there, right? It's, right. There's an appreciation and a willingness from all these different characters to understand each other. Right. I really enjoy yeah, I appreciate what you brought to that conversation, Tori. Thank you. You know, it's so, and you know, what you're bringing to Brenda, just because I hadn't even realized the accent thing and how just, yeah. you know, just it's revolutionary. Oh That's not a word, but just what kind of revelation and what kind of work it was doing and intentionally, unintentionally. I just, like, a, you, like you, I just grew up with those accents all the time. And yeah. so for me, it, was, it wasn't, anything hearing uncle or jackie speak their authentic english right or but with that accent thing, yeah but the awful thing about it is all of us have experiences where our family members because of the type of english that they speak have experienced some form of discrimination right um i certainly grew up with my dad speaking i guess quote unquote broken english and people looking at him funny because of it right and it's like it's not that he's it's not that any of these characters are dumb right they speak well 
you just there yeah. has to be a willingness on the part of the listener to try and understand right but that be, takes mutual effort that doesn't mean that you get to dismiss them because they have an accent right mm -hmm. and I, I do like that this is that this series tries to normalize that right and say these accents are normal and yeah. the form of english is perfectly acceptable regardless of what it what you think and it normalization is something that i think we're all trying to do in our own classrooms as well right okay. we all do a sort of what is your english type of essay mm -hmm. in our classroom where we use amazon duo we use amy 10 amy 10 yeah, is a short story where she talks about broken english uh and growing up with you know, that kind of discrimination Brenda talks about, right? Uh, Jamila Lyscott also talks about her Englishes in a very powerful wor um, spoken word, mm -hmm. you know, TED Talk. And so you do, we do do that work, but that normalization work, we're seeing a little bit more nowadays. It's definitely being pushed in our curricula and being pushed by like our departments. But it's something that you didn't see a lot growing up in, as children. We had, that was why Jackie Chan is that effect for us because it was, he was one of the few actors out there that got to speak yeah. with his accent and have very popular blockbuster films and yeah. do yeah. all these things, right? And you know it's well done because we didn't really think about it much at the time, right? Um, yeah. And it's something that it was just a given, right? And I think that's one of the things that's so well done with this series is that normalization is so subtle and so well done that we took a, we took it away from us and it's informed much of how we construct our own classroom. Definitely. I think I just thought about my talisman power. I think I I'd be the bull. That. I was like, Jen never answered that. I'm gonna make her. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about it because I had to think about what the powers were. Because you're a Ravenclaw. Of course. Of course. I'm just, I think I'd take the power of the ball be super strong. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. Nice. One of the things right, I you cut off. Uh, I chose the bowl. Ah, okay. So I do have a story about Jackie Chan and how it impacted my brother in our adult lives to this day. So my brother is an aspiring author, artist, creative, very, very creative, very fantastic. Um, and he's been working on this graphic novel for a really long time. I'm not gonna get into details of it, but um, he was stuck for like a while trying to name this character. Like he just was like, I can't name this character. And my brother and I both like, it's this thing that like when we're starting to get stressed out, we, we to this day will go like, you mo guai guai fai ti zao, you mo guai guai fai ti zao. <laughs> like it just calms us down. Like we don't know what it means, but that's what uncle did and it makes us feel better. And then my brother was like, like I think it means something about like evil demons be gone or something. Yeah, yeah. And so like my brother had this writer's block and he was thinking, thinking, and then like he, like texts me and all kinds. He's like, I've got it, I've got it, come over. So I go over and I'm like, okay, what did you name this character? What's happening? And he goes, Yumo. <laughs> and for the Yumo Wag Wi Fi teeth out. And so it was great, but that's just like the stroke of like genius he had, right? Like it was like this personal connection because we were like so obsessed with Jackie Chan Adventures. Um, and we still like, and like the other one, Lush with Sai, we say a lot too, um, which was like bring flood or something, which is very dark magic, but it was just like the other one. <laughs> like, so. See, that's the thing that I like about the dragon, right? It feels very dark because of the combustion. And so like, if you pair that with my horse one, right? The healing, I feel like I would yeah. have the powers of um, life at my hands, right? Like on one hand, I can like, that's super metal of you, and I'm super into it. Also, like, for <laughs> Gemini of you, wanting to be both, like, healer and, then, like, <laughs> combustion hitter. Absolutely. Absolutely. I Meanwhile, I'm the Pisces that wants to float away with the <laughs> Well, don't get me wrong. The astral projection power is pretty badass, I think. But, um... Yeah, no, I, you're right. It was very Gemini of me. I love that. Speaking of astral projection, it reminded me of the tiger talisman when Jackie splits into good and evil, his yin and yang. Oh my god, I love that episode. Right, and ja good Jackie's, or yin, ja I forget which one's yin and which one's yang, I'm sorry. But, um, light Jackie is like, I squished the bug, and he's like crying, and Uncle's like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like, and then right. he's like, oh, 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 o
<laughs> and then Dark Jackie like steals that like leather jacket. And, like, yeah. But like, can we talk a little bit? Like, I think Brenda brought it up because of like, her tomboy teen aesthetic that she was aiming for. But can we talk a little bit about like the fashion on the show? Like, what Uncle wears, like the vest and like the kind of slovenly kind of look. Like, that's stuff that my dad wears and, like, will wear. And, like, he loves a good vest. And, you know, it's very Asian, like, yeah. like what he wears. Well, Not I Asian. Just, I just no. associate that with, like, old Asian men. <laughs> I, I, no, I understand. So I was fortunate enough that um, my mom, uh, so I mentioned earlier, my mom worked in a sweatshop. So I had um, two Korean grandparents. <laughs> Um, they were really my grandparents, but they kind of adopted yeah. me. They always thought of, they always had like gifts for me for my birthday. Oh, they would invite me to their house, and so like I had for me my Asian upbringing was the Korean side, right? Because they were both Korean, and so they would share a lot of their culture with me. Um, I was very fortunate in that regard. But my Asian grandfather, um, wh who would always call, have me call him Mr. Gim, right? Um, Kim, but Gim with the G, right? um he would wear the same thing that uncle wears right um very similar and i i agree with you jen it was it it became a style that i very much associated with him but also with the uncle character right um it was always vests and sometimes a hat depending on if it was really sunny he'd wear he'd add a hat but usually it was like those um cargo pants or just loose feeding pants and a shirt a polo shirt with um the vest over it so and then so yeah, I mean, to me, <laughs> Uncle very much looked like my Asian grandfather. Yeah, but I liked how the clothes seemed very affordable. Like, it's something that maybe was a hand-me-down that, like, as we all kind of experience hand-me-downs in our own family, right? You just, mm -hmm. you grow into it, right? They were not going to throw clothes away. Like, my parents are such huge hoarders for that reason. They don't ever want to throw anything away. It's like, mom, dad, we don't have space for, you guys don't have space in where you live for all of this stuff. And they're like, no, it's, you know, you don't know how much, how much money went into like how hard it was to earn the money to buy the thing. So we're never going to throw away. So it's definitely something that is a very generational mm -hmm. conflict between us as, you know, Marie Kondo goes out there and tells you if it doesn't bring you joy anymore, throw it away. This does not spark joy. Get rid of it. <laughs> like that. Right works and you're like but mom you have five other pans that can do the same thing that are newer that you actually use no but i exactly. still use it and to prove exactly. a point pull that exactly. pan and you it in front of you sorry yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so it no. a little close to home i'm sorry yeah yeah but what i loved about that fashion was that it was all just very affordable it looks very affordable it looks like hand-me-downs it looks like it wasn't aesthetic. Like a lot of anime shows do like aesthetic. Like Card Captor yeah. Sakura does a lot of aesthetics. Like you can't find that stuff. Your costuming is right. like. Right, but all of the clothes that the show characters wore seems like, except for the Valmont green suit, right? But everything on the show seems something like you could pick up at a Goodwill, yeah. at a thrift shop, at a Salvation Army store, at a, just like a Gap, right? Like I think Jackie's look, the blue long sleeve and the beige, pants is very gap look right very capsule look and so I like that the show wasn't going for aesthetic but it in even in that it seems very real and very approachable for that reason for me that oh yeah I can just pick up that kind of sweater and the swap me mm -hmm. right that was something that yeah really just made the show for me and made it work for me because I think had they been wearing different types of outfits that are a bit more fashionable if a little bit more brand on brand yeah, I wouldn't have connected with the show as much. Yeah, yeah and um, what I really liked too in the after the show, at, like after the episode is over, like we get this kind of one-on-one -on -one with Jackie where Jade asks him a question that uh, a child somewhere in the world has asked Jackie. And oftentimes, like he's in that one, I don't know what they're called, but it's like a, it's very much a, like a Chinese traditional jacket. And he's, he wears that a lot, um, the like kind of grayish one. Um, and he's in that a lot. And I was like, yeah, he's like totally like weaving in culture here, like for his real life counterpart. And like, I really, I really enjoyed it all around. Um, and then El Toro with fashion, he will take off his his luchador mask. Um, yeah. There's very much an emphasis on function, right? With all of their outfits. And I think that lends to the 
ease with which we relate to these characters, right? Because you're right. It's stuff that we could easily get ourselves or stuff that we see when we walk down the stairs. Walk, sorry, down the street. I don't know what I'm thinking. You're down thinking I want to leave the stairs everywhere. from my house in quarantine. <laughs> because that's as much outside as we're getting. I think the stairs is the only place we can go. The stairs to pick up the Amazon package. Exactly. <laughs> it's um wow that really is messy with my psyche <laughs> but yeah it's there's there's such a relatability with just the function of these clothes and how easily accessible they are for all of us right and so it's not just something that we can see ourselves wearing but it's stuff that we can see our neighbors or our friends wearing because you're right it's something you can pick up at a thrift shop or even at your local Kmart right um for me that was like that's when I was hitting it big right when I could get a shirt at Kmart I was like ooh, we're rolling in it now yeah it was Ross stores for my mom Goodwill stores I mentioned earlier, my mom was a seamstress. Yeah, most of my clothes were made at home. I think when I started getting older, and obviously, you know, the teenage them hit because all your other friends are getting the so-called cold clothes or whatnot, you know, I eventually upgraded into Sears clothing to get more trendy. Yeah, Miss Fancy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it was definitely that peer pressure, social influence, right? I, I wanted to be part of that cool crowd. But for a long time, I was dressing a lot like Jade, a lot like Uncle and and Jackie and just very, you know, functional outfits that are wear affordable that you could find it's at so, all of these places. Yeah, it's so interesting that you guys are bringing up the kind of like affordable clothes and stuff because um, I went to Catholic school, so we had uniform. And I had... Two outfits like outside of school like two outfits and the rest were pajamas like I like so clothes especially in childhood years are was like such a foreign concept to me like I was like I had my uniform which I wore every single day <laughs> and like that was I that. Went to school, I went to school in South Central so mm. all of my every single school that I had that I went to had a very strict uniform policy, mm -hmm. right? Um, I remember in my middle school, like the first assembly we had, it was like, oh, there's a lot of gang activity, so the uniform is mandatory. All right, fine. So that means I'm wearing khakis and a white shirt for the rest of okay. three years, right? And then Jen and I went to high school together, and the same thing, very strong uniform policy, khakis and a blue shirt, right? So for me, um, fashion was more like, oh, my jacket. I get to wear a nice oh. jacket or sweater, right? Um, but um, like on weekends is what I think um, that's where I got to experiment with clothes and it was very much jade aesthetic. We were allowed one ring and one bracelet. If we wanted a jacket or a hoodie it had to be the uniform version like there wasn't like we got free dress every so often and everyone was like mm, look at me with my Ugg boots and my like <laughs> leggings <laughs> or like whatever we like, had, like yeah. spirit week and that's where we got to experiment right jen yes like we would have photo shoots and you weren't allowed to wear makeup um until i don't that you weren't allowed to wear makeup at all K I the first eight. time i ever and wore makeup jen put it on me I high school they let you wear makeup but it was like restricted to like foundation and eyeliner and like I don't think you were allowed to do lipstick and boys could not wear makeup um oh, wow. you know. yeah I grew up with uniforms as well so I just remember that a lot of my outfits my mom bought my mom bought obviously and she would shop at Ross a lot she would shop at the swap meet down like the road from us so I would have like a lot of like sweatpants sweats with like the off-brand like Mickey Mouse or something on it um but we would also like do a lot of yard sales so I remember like I would like I had a favorite pair of, of overalls short overalls so they were like shorts but there were overalls as well that's, so that's like such 90s my, iconic fashion <laughs> yeah I used to love that, but I don't, I think my mom either got it at a yard sale or at Goodwill. It was one of those things where it wasn't, it wasn't brand new. I was a tomboy who would wear squirts and love them. I <laughs> love you rocking a squirt. I love them. Like, because like, you would think pants, the skirt that, looks feminine. The skirt looks feminine, but you know, I have thunder thighs, so I need the shorts underneath. I love squirts so much. <laughs> And then when I got to middle school and I started real, like kids started teasing me over them. I 
stopped wearing them, Aww. but I really miss the skorts. And Bring I think them that back. That. Just start wearing them again. I'll support you. I'll just, I just wear skirts now because I like them, but yeah. Yeah. Brenda's evolution into dresses has been a journey. <laughs> it has been a journey and Jen has been with me the entire time. Yes. I went from a, being a very strong tomboy who was really into like, heavy metal and like a lot of dark aesthetic to like a girly girl and I like pink now as you can yeah was that because <laughs> it's just one shade off your enemy's blood <laughs> <laughs> yes yes but I think that's what I really appreciated um from the show is that ability to see this these functional clothes and not fashionable tr clothes but functional clothes just on the big screen and i really am sad that like not a lot of our like younger generations grew up with that because they think they need that they need to see that like fashion isn't perfect and it's like they're, they're getting like riverdale aesthetics like with that makeup artist High fashion like right. makeup like, of course, we all want to be Veronica Lodge or yeah, Betty. Right? Like, like, and just it. Fair. Our version, our generation's version of that was Gossip Girl. So I think that was even better. Like when Veronica goes to the jacuzzi and that like super expensive like robe thing that's like trailing behind her, I'm like, you're 16. How can you afford this? And she's like, oh, right. this little thing. Let me just get into my bikini now. Like, <laughs> Definitely. So I'm. You know, we had Gossip Girl. We also had, like One Tree Hill growing up, and like the OC weren't. So we did have, but they're all like fashionable in their own way, right? But I'm just, again, it's not realistic, yeah. right? Like a lot of like I know that I suffered a lot of insecurities because sometimes I felt like, oh, that's not a very fashionable outfit. It's not matchy matchy or whatever. Right. But I I hope that like more shows like Jackie Chan Adventures come out and where like the fashion looks reasonable and realistic and it, it inspires you know younger folks to realize that you know fashion is ever evolving and it's what makes fashion fashion is that you you experiment with it and right. it doesn't always have to look pristine and on brands right because you know clothes also serve the functional aspect of things so yeah so on that note, you guys, let's start sharing our final thoughts on Jackie Chan Adventures and what you hope this will mean to not just you, what it means to you now, but also what you hope it will mean to like future generations. Yeah. Do you want me to take it, Jen, or do you want to start? You can go for it. Okay. I, what I think I, like a kind of closing that I have on Jackie is, um, I just when I think about kind of the late 90s, early 2000s, I think about the just, I just feel like we were in this like little section of like, I, it must have been experimental because I don't feel like it's there anymore of just all of these minority led shows that were just like, we had Sister Sister, Proud Family, That's So Raven, Juniper Lee, uh, Card Captors, Jackie Chan Adventures, like just all of these like minority-led shows, um, Gargoyles with, like, um, Elisa, right, um, and, like, I just, I think about that, and I, I don't, well, I feel like shows today have these minority characters, I don't feel like they're the central character, which they were for us growing up, um, and I feel like that's such a great takeaway to take from, kind of, that era, and Jackie Chan, and, what he's kind of doing. I mean, this show aged incredible, way better than I thought it was. Um, I thought it was going to be rough. And then my husband, who's never seen it, um, is like, wait, can we watch more? This is really good. Um, like, he's been really enjoying it. And he's an adult and has never seen it and didn't grow up with it. And he's like, wait, this is like super interesting. Um, so I do think it's aged really well. I would love for a remake to happen. I would love, I, I also think it's just an important kind of story to tell because it doesn't have like the model minority. It doesn't deal with like a lot of the stereotypes that come with Asian characters on television where, cause I feel like the stereotype is shifting now where we're getting less, you know, air quote, smart Asians on screen. And we're getting more air quote, dumb Asians on screen. Yeah. And it's like, like that doesn't, help. <laughs> like, it's like to balance out the smart stereotype, I guess. Like, but it's, I don't know. I thought Jackie did a great job and I would love for it to come back in a reboot or a live action, like a movie. Like I would definitely watch that. <laughs> How about you, Jen? 
say same things that Tori just said. I, you know, this show obviously has a huge place in my own heart, just mm-hmm. in terms of representation and seeing seeing a lot of myself and my family in it and just the memories that it brought, like being able to have that moment, those moments with my dad and have a connection because, you know, sometimes we don't get each other very well. And so having that is, it was nice just to have those experiences with my dad, but seeing again, things that didn't adhere to like the model minority role was really helpful, right? Seeing it, seeing what how identity doesn't have to just be restricted to just what society wants you to be was really important Mm -hmm. and i i hope like tori said like it gets rebooted in some sort of way maybe i I don't know how interested parties are but i think if they're not interested at least being able to you know have this kind of second wave of viewers who are suddenly finding a show for the first time and enjoying it and having more conversation around it would be really good even a remaster like just where they touch up the art a little or something put a fresh coat of paint on um right i think that would be fantastic i would i would love that and i hope that viewers i hd (laughs) yes I hope viewers find it. I hope that people enjoy it as much as we do. I hope that we get more wholesome cartoons Mm -hmm. that are like that for the future because I think that we don't get that enough. We get a lot more like Rick and Morty, right? We get a lot of very sardonic, very satiric, very fourth wall breaking yeah. abrasive cartoons nowadays and we don't get enough wholesome cartoons and i hope that we get more of that with more like tori said minority anything animated really on because i'm thinking about what my sister watches it might just be she's not interested but my sister's 10 and even growing up i i really don't recall her watching any type of cartoon on disney channel or nickelodeon outside of me forcing her to watch like avatar the last airbender or something like i just don't feel like it's there anymore i think we get a lot of more sitcoms like we get a lot of like yeah. you know area ariana grande kind of disney shows right yeah. um yeah, yeah, yeah. so the I, value for those are a little cheaper right and it doesn't take as long to put on a live action than it does an animation right right yeah so and i hope that we have a dozen in la and hollywood and right so yeah. i hope we get more wholesome shows like that in the future i think mm-hmm. If there is not a market, there should be a market. Because, you know, millennials are getting older and having children and we miss this. So we yeah. I wanna watch it, I'll watch it. Uh, if, if my if future children don't wanna watch it, I'll watch it. I know these two will watch it. So yeah. I, I hope to see more of that in the future. Absolutely. I, I wanna add, I think, um, and this is one of my pet peeves is I often hear people say, oh, representation matters, representation matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course it does. Why? Right? I think we often just kind of end at that. And I think what we underestimate is the power that normalizing our lived experience has, right? Um, For white folks, seeing themselves on the screen is something is not new, right? Um, So we get the diversity of what it means to be white um, on screen every time and we never question it, right? so because it's so normalized you know when a white character does something no one questions it right it just is what it is um but we often don't get that same level of respect we don't get that same level of um space to work in i guess right um it's as you mentioned it's you're either the smart asian or the dumb one but there's no space in between and i think in trying to equate that or balance that out there's actually a severe sense of damage being done right to what that identity is and how layered asian identity can be how layered black identity can be how layered latino identity or latinx identity can be right because guess what if you're latino that doesn't necessarily mean you're from mexico right my family's from el salvador um you don't see my people on tv at all right like we're not there Um, So what happens is our experience gets erased oftentimes. And so anything that we do 
is seen as out of the scope of normal. It's other, right? And so when you say representation matters, what we're saying is we need to make sure that our experiences are normalized so that when we do something, it's not, oh, it's because it's those people, right? People will look at us as human beings first. And I think that's one of the things that fiction has the power to do and why we demand representation, right? Why we demand that these stories don't just show us what the pretty blonde girl can do, right? That they show us what all of us can do and how we deal with trauma, how we deal with joy, right? Because the way we deal with joy in our respective communities is so different from others, right? And that's okay, right? We also deal with loss and grief in very different ways and yet very similar ways, right? And there's a humanizing effect to seeing all of these stories play out. And I think that's one of the things that I really appreciate about Jackie Chan Adventures. It's that sense of community that you see with this disparate family that just kind of came together because they had to, right? But there's a love and appreciation for each other that I think is universal, right? And in seeing that, hopefully, in normalizing these stories, we see that the human experience is actually quite lovely and quite universal. Um, it's just those nuances that are different and in their difference, they're beautiful. And I think that's my hope for more stories like Jackie Chan um, adventures and hopefully other stories that we've, you know, we don't see necessarily, but we, I think children deserve and should be exposed to. Absolutely. Yeah. Just that that in such a beautiful way. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, moving on. So, um, sorry. I uh, speaking of cultural things, I actually can't take a compliment. Well, so um, next week we are going to be uh, discussing Mulan to continue our appreciation of Asian heroes and Asian stories. So, um, I Tori and I want to apologize in advance because we will likely burst into song because that is probably oh, yeah. our favorite yeah that's probably our favorite disney soundtrack and we can't help ourselves so we are going to embarrass jen a little bit on that oh, yes and ourselves and ourselves yes for <laughs> sure um i yeah. definitely don't want my students finding those videos but oh well i can't help myself just to put into perspective i i almost recorded it but i i did it i'm going to try doing this in the future as we were prepping this one, we were kind of talking about what we were going to talk about. And we're like, oh yeah, next time it's going to be Mulan. And without missing a beat, Brenda and I burst into song for about an hour. Um, and just talking about Mulan, singing about Mulan, like acting like Mulan. He would pick up a verse, I'd continue it, then he'd start another one, I'd continue we're it. Cutting our new tails off with a sword. Like, it's expected. It's long. going to be a lot of story sharing and sing-alongs with these two next week. <laughs> It's so, gonna be a lot of Jen trying to wrangle us in, like um, cats who can't sit still. <laughs> but that's the fun of it. So if you guys continue to love us and love hearing us, and please watch Mulan so that you guys can get in on the fun. We'll be talking about the movie, its impact on us, both in childhood and adulthood, because I came into it very late. I had a very different experience from these two. That's so like fascinating to me that you didn't like, weren't exposed as a child because it was like so, it was like our generation's Frozen. <laughs> right. So it, it's a very interesting story that I'll share then, but <laughs> Again, thank you for listening to us. We look forward to our recording, to our next recording and to having you there. And we hope you have a great week. Before Bye. you go, um, just quick thing, just a quick add addition, Mulan's better than Frozen. Bye. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye guys. <laughs>